So today I'm going to talk about when to take a biopsy in the presence of gastritis. This is driven by the fact that there tends to be a bit of confusion about when to take a biopsy in upper GI endoscopy at all. And also because we are seeing unnecessary biopsies being taken, which of course has an impact on healthcare resource, an environmental impact, and just prolongs procedure time. In the presence of gastritis, there are only two reasons to take a biopsy. One is if you want to confirm or refute the diagnosis of atrophic gastritis. If that is the case, you need to take Sydney protocol biopsies, which are two from the antrum, one from the incisura, one lesser curve and one greater curve. You can watch Matthew Banks's video on that, who is the author of the BSG guidelines on uh, pre-malignant stomachs. We may get to the stage when we don't need to take biopsies for atrophic gastritis, but that's a different conversation. The second time you need to take a biopsy in the presence of gastritis is if you want to confirm or refute the diagnosis of Helicobacter pylori. All other reasons to take a biopsy in the stomach really are unnecessary, unless there's something abnormal, of course you see you need to confirm. So, then we need to talk about Helicobacter pylori and how to diagnose it. So, in terms of invasive testing, and by that I mean endoscopic testing for Helicobacter pylori, it's been long thought that the, the histopathological diagnosis of Helicobacter pylori was the gold standard. In order to do that, if you are going down the histology route of diagnosing Helicobacter, you need to take two biopsies from the antrum and two biopsies from the body. This increases your yield and also reflects the fact that um, the population of Helicobacter is not in one place. It will move around and is varied and of course in different densities. Generally speaking, they use h &E staining, but they can also do further staining. Now, the sensitivity and specificity for this is very high. Sensitivity above 95%, specificity above 99%. So this is very good. Now, of course, here I'm talking about diagnosing Helicobacter pylori in the absence of PPI. And we'll come on to PPIs in a second. The problem with histolog histological diagnosis of Helicobacter pylori is it's slow and more expensive and time consuming. So the alternative which is just as good really, is a rapid urease test or a CLO test as we know. And we know that the sensitivity for this is you know, above 90%, certainly around about 93, 95%, and specificity is 95 to 100%. Therefore, if one is wanting to diagnose Helicobacter pylori, really you should be taking a CLO test and not relying upon a histological diagnosis. The final circumstance in which one can invasively diagnose Helicobacter pylori is using cultures. Now, these are, of course, very specific, 100% specificity, but the sensitivity, of course, drops down. The only context in which you want to do cultures for Helicobacter pylori is if you have someone who has had at least two goes at properly taking Helicobacter eradication, and that is so, so it's gone through second line therapy and has still got Helicobacter present. In that case, you can consider cultures, but certainly culturing before then is not appropriate. Now, in real life terms, of course, um, quite often patients are on PPI. So before you do an endoscopy, it's always worth establishing if a patient is on a PPI or not. Also consider whether they've taken antibiotics recently or not. Ideally, before an invasive test for uh, hel his, hel helicobacter, they need to have stopped PPI at least two weeks before the endoscopy and antibiotics four weeks before the endoscopy. So then if we talk about real life circumstances, what if the patient's on a PPI, how do I diagnose Helicobacter? So across the board, whether that be invasive or non-invasive sampling, your sensitivities do drop down if patients are on a PPI or even H2 antagonist. So the rapid urease test, the CLO test, that sensitivity drops significantly. Now there's a lot of variance in the data, but somewhere between a 50 to 75% uh, sensitivity. So a significant drop down. That's essentially because the test relies on a certain population density of Helicobacter to be present to produce enough urease to therefore make the pH change. So of course, by taking PPI, you're dropping down that population density um, and therefore um, you'll get a false negative potentially. Whenever I take a, 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 a rapid urease test um, endoscopically, you certainly want to take two biopsies, one from the antrum, one from the body and put them in the same pot that increases your diagnostic yield whether they're on PPI or not. But if they are on a PPI and you're taking a clone test, then of course, to at least take two biopsies and put them in the rapid urease test. Probably if they're on a PPI, however, and you need to know whether they have helicobacter or not, then probably you need to then go on to histological diagnoses. 
at this point, you, this relies less on population density and hopefully can pick up a lower population density. You have to accept, of course, there is a false negative rate in histological diagnosis as well, because by taking a PPI, the population is reduced and therefore your chance of hitting it with a biopsy is less. In this case, again, as I said earlier, you take two antral biopsies, two body biopsies, and accept that you may miss it and get false negatives. Probably the sensitivity in histological diagnosis uh, um, of H. pylori on PPI probably drops down to somewhere around 60 to 75 percent. The other content you need to be aware of is in the presence of atrophy, your, um, your diagnosis of helicobacter will be reduced as well. So again, taking those two body, two antral biopsies is important. Then we go on to non-invasive testing for helicobacter. We talk about the breath test and the stool antigen test. Um, a breath test, you know, depends on what your access is like that. You know, we don't have great access to that locally. So actually, I always rely on stool antigen tests, which actually is very sensitive and um, sensitive to about 94, 95%, specificity 97%. So it's a really good test, the stool antigen test. It probably is slightly less affected by PPI therapy as well. Some data suggests that its sensitivity drops around about 75 to 85% on PPI. So I think if the patient is unable to stop their PPI for whatever reason, a stool antigen is certainly best, and, and in generally speaking, when you're testing for helicobacter, you want to avoid invasive testing as it is. So in that instance, I'd certainly rely on stool antigen except a degree of false negative testing.